let's stand to your feet wherever you're at today. Come on, let's give Jesus the best praise we have. He's worthy, amen. Let's celebrate the life we have in him today. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind away? It was my tomb till I met you. Thank you, Lord. We'll sing it.
piece of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston and New York to LA. There's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first message in our Summer at Gilead series. Uh, I thought long and hard about what are we going to do this summer since uh, we have people telling us uh, in authority uh, that you can't normally do the things that you do to enjoy summer, and uh, you shouldn't do those things because yeah, they're not safe anymore, and uh, it's not going to be as a sermon on my opinion about those authorities, although I do have my opinions. I'm sure you do too. But we decided to do a series on how to live our life in Christ or with Christ to the fullest. Because I think a lot of people feel restricted 
in living life to the fullest because, as I shared, we can't do the things we normally do, and, and, and even when we're doing them, it has changed. So how in this climate, in these circumstances, are we supposed to live life with Christ to the fullest? And so this first message, we're going to talk about summer, and, and when, summer is my favorite time of year. Uh, I, I would like it if it was summer all year round. Uh, you might, you know, when I hear people say, oh, I love winter, and I love it, it, that's just not me. I get excited when summer comes around. When I was a kid, here's what summer meant. Buzz cuts. Yes, I did have hair, and I needed a buzz cut. I mean, taking uh, the, the two pair of jeans that I got at the beginning of school, and they are now no more knee patches needed because they get cut off, and they become your shorts for the summer, and you trade in your cowboy boots for tennis shoes to play outside. And because of the time change, that means that the days are long, lots of light. You can get up and have breakfast and be on the baseball field at 9 o'clock in the morning, go there on your bicycle and you know, run home and get food for lunch and then run back out and play Till the street lights go on. I mean, summertime was great. And I would play so hard as a kid. I don't know about you, but you might remember taking a bath as a kid in the summertime and getting out of the bathtub, and there was that dark ring around the tub. Yeah, because why? We were playing so hard in the summer. I have very fond memories of summer uh, from my childhood. I still enjoy summer. The cooking out, the playing now with the grandkids, it's just a special time of year for me. I love the, the, the sight. I love the smells of it. I love listening to the crickets and, and all the, the lawn cutting and the, the smell of the fresh cut grass. I, I love it all. I love it all. So how are we going to enjoy our summer? Jesus tells us in John chapter 16, that it isn't, life isn't always going to be fun and games. In fact, in verse 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me, Jesus is in your relationship with him, not in our circumstances, not if the weather's great, not if the kids are there to play with you, not if you know, everything's going on right in our world and everybody's acting the way they want us, that we want them to. No, he said, in our relationship with him, we can have peace. You will have suffering and difficulty in this world. But be courageous, Jesus says. I have conquered the world. He said, in this world, it's not always going to be fun and games. It's not always going to be circumstances that we like and enjoy or would even choose for ourselves. And so Jesus writes that our relationship with him is what enables us to enjoy life, to enjoy life. So let me give you the context of what we're reading in John, the 15th chapter. Jesus has already met with his disciples in the upper room, and the upper room meaning the last time they are going to eat the Passover together. He has told them very uh, emphatically that he, was, he came to suffer and die and they didn't quite understand, but he being a God in the flesh, he knew exactly. He had planned this before this world was formed, and it was going to go down exactly the way he planned. And so he's preparing them for the next days and the, the next weeks because it's going to be traumatic for them. They're going to see him falsely arrested, falsely accused, beaten uh, to... Uh, an image that doesn't resemble a man and then crucified. And their hopes and dreams are going to get shattered right before their eyes. Their circumstance in life is going to dramatically change for the worse. And so he's walking from the upper room outside the city after they've eaten the, what we historically know as the Last Supper, the Passover meal together with his men. And they're, they're on their way to the, the grove of olive trees, and he has an opportunity to speak to them. And really, it's the last conversation before his crucifixion that he has. And you know what he talks about? He talks about love and joy. He talks about how to have joy. It, it, it just, it's weird to me 
that he would be talking about joy, but that's what was on the mind of Jesus as he was preparing to go to the cross. And he says this to this John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11, and he tells them and gives them a progression of things on how to enjoy life. He says, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. And he has shown that love to them for three years. So he says, remain, stay in my love. And so here's the progression. If we choose to humble ourselves and surrender our life to Jesus Christ, his love takes care of us and makes us a new creation. And he says, as we remain in our loves, then what can happen next? If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. He tells us how to remain in his love by keeping his commandments. You say, oh, that's impossible. But I, I don't even like, no, love is what changes it. Love changes the commands of God from I have to do it, which is impossible, to I want to do it because love changes our attitude toward what they say. Love is the big game changer. So he says, of course, if you love me, you're going to be doing my commands just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And so then he says, I've spoken to you these things so that what? We know what we have to do. No. He says, I've spoken these things to you so that my joy may be in you, so that the joy that Jesus had that he was thinking about as he was preparing for the crucifixion, so we can experience that joy. And that is a joy that goes far beyond his immediate circumstances. Could I get a good amen to that? Because he's staring dead on at the cross. He's staring dead on at the crown of thorns and getting beaten and his life coming to an end very brutally. And yet it says he had joy. And he wants to share that joy with us so that we can have that and that our joy may be complete. So if you're lacking some joy in your life, if you're kind of angry and upset because I, I go, I've, I've been dealing with frustration and anger about, oh, yay, we get to live in the one state that's still shut down when everybody else is saying, man, I'm enjoying my summer. Whoa, don't even get me started, right? But he, yet he said, in spite of all that, we can have his joy so that our joy, so he has a joy that can complete our experience of joy. So what is joy? Of course, joy is not happiness. Joy is a positive, we've defined it as a positive confidence that we can possess by knowing and trusting God regardless of the circumstance, the circle of happenings that we're standing in right now. Jesus looking, I'm sorry, Scripture looking back on what Jesus was going through as he was looking at the cross in the garden. It says this in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 2, that we are to keep our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured the cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. How did Jesus endure that moment? By taking on himself our curse and our judgment and our shame and our guilt, he looked past it to the joy before him. And that joy was all those who would become believers in the throne room of heaven, worshiping him as King of kings and Lord of lords, and us all being one with the Father and him. He said, that's my joy. He looked beyond his circumstances and had a confidence that what he was going to do on the cross was going to bring that about for millions and millions of people, and that brought him joy. Now, there's some things that I, I guess you could say joy stealers, or uh, in your notes I call them joy blockers, things that keep us from experiencing this kind of confidence in our trust and relationship with Christ. And I think the first one is very uh, a list of a couple of things I wrote down is fear, or you might call it worry, thinking things aren't going to work out, or well, how about tomorrow, how's, this, how's our country going to come back from this, and, that's it, and all the conspiracy and all the this and the that, and you say, oh, do you, are you just naive, Pastor? No, there's always that going on. 
It's just that in the world we live today, it's just you can see it plain as day. You can either uh, cause it to put you in a moment of fear and, and, and abject worry to where you can't even get through the day and you're frustrated all the time. And, or we can just let God be God and us do what we can do. So fear is a joy blocker. Another one is selfishness. You know, sometimes when life isn't happening the way we want it to happen, or if we don't like our self, it's, if we don't like our circumstance, we say, well, you know what? Everybody else is just doing what they want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I'm just going to, you know, basically just, you know, take a powder and responsibility and, and not, you know, not, not be the responsible grandpa anymore. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And that selfishness leads to something else, bitterness, because selfish people aren't happier. No, selfish people are more bitter because taking matters into their own hands and living for themselves, it doesn't bring them the joy. And so they're getting their way and they're not experiencing that, you know, that, that purposeful contentment. And so they get bitter and they're like, ah. And so when they see other people have it, they start being haters. Because why? That bitterness causes hatred to splash over on those around us. Another joy blocker is sin and guilt. When we actually act out on that bitterness and, and then, we've, you know, then we do wrong things and there's the guilt and the shame that, and it's kind of like pile on. And then the last joy blocker is isolation. We say, you know, since I'm not doing this well, I'm just going to isolate myself. I'll just leave everybody alone. James says it this way, that those difficulties that we're living through right now, that we are to consider it a great joy, an opportunity for the joy that we have in our relationship with Jesus Christ to shine in our life, to come through in our life. He says, joy, my brothers, really comes to the surface when you experience trials. So the opposite is also true. If you're trusting in your circumstances when difficulty comes and your circumstances change, you're going to be miserable. But if your joy is that confidence based on a relationship with Christ because he loves you and you're responding in that love, then that joy is going to float to the surface and you're going to be, everybody's going to be looking at you and going, man, what... What are you taking and where can I get some? Because you're not frustrated and you're not reacting the same way as everybody else. Paul says in Romans 14, for the kingdom of God is not about our circumstances, what we eat and drink, where we get to go, what we get to do. No, the kingdom of God is about righteousness, right living, right thinking, peace. There's that thinking and joy, that settled confidence in the Holy Spirit. The psalmist writes it this way, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Another version says with cheerful songs. When I was playing ball in college, you know, we had cheerleaders. And cheerleaders were supposed to fire up the crowd, especially. You don't have to get a crowd fired up with cheerleaders when things are going your way and you're winning. Man, the crowd's on its feet and they're like, yeah, that's just like, yeah, yeah. When do you need cheerleaders? When it's not going well. When you're down by 12 points and there's only three minutes on the clock, and man, something's going to happen, and they're like, come on. Because usually the fans are what? They're like, oh, this is over. This, it, it's not going to happen. And they quit cheering, and the players feel that. So, man, when, they, when they're cheering with you, when the chips are down, man, that's when you're like, come on, we can get this done. But you don't hear the cheering when you're winning because you don't need it when you're winning, when things are going your way. We need to sing those cheerful songs, especially when things are not going our way. So how do we restore, if we, how do we restore our joy if we're like, okay, Pastor, I'll, I'm with you. This thing we've lived through for a couple months now, man, I, it has blocked my joy and I'm I'm a different person because of it. And I, how about this? I don't like who I've become. And I want some of that joy that I had before restored to my life. I'm glad you're wanting that because that's what this message, the key, the kickoff message to our summer at Gilead is all about. 
So let's find out how to restore our joy. I think the first step, it, it's maybe the most important, and that is admit that we have lost our joy. Admit that we've lost it. Because sometimes as Christians, we like to pretend, well, how are you doing through all this? Oh, man, I'm fine. It's okay. We're getting through. Come on. Jesus is on, still on the throne. And we throw out catchphrases, but really we, we get, get alone, get in our car, and we're like, man, I hate this. This stinks, and I wish it was over. And, and we recognize that the joy is gone. You know, David, he lost his joy, and it was through his own choices. Uh, he had slept with another man's wife, and then killed her husband, one of his faithful mighty men generals, to cover up his misdeed with her. And when he's confronted by Nathan, the prophet, you know, he goes into his room and he cries out to God. He says, man, I'm not worthy. I, could, I confess my flaws and, and you know, I, I'm evil beyond my comprehension. And then he says this. He asks God, he says, man... Restore, Psalm 51, 12, restore the joy of your salvation to me. And once again, give me a right and willing spirit. David is telling God, I don't have any joy. In another psalm, we write that he, he's describing this moment in his life, and he says, man, my bones were brittle. I was sick to my core. I thought I was going to die. Because why? He had no joy. No settled confidence in his life, in his relationship with the Lord. And he said, God, I would love to tell you I can do this, but God, you're going to have to do this. Restore your joy into my life. So admit we've lost our joy. Secondly, once we admit that, then we can start making right choices. Choose to get that joy back. To say, God, restore your joy to me. I'm going to keep living and thinking and, and listening to the same things. Maybe we need to turn off all the inputs that are telling us all the negative things and all the whiners and complainers and negativity that's on the news media and, and all the social media and it's all oh, this and the conspiracy and over and over. Maybe we need to just turn it off and tune, tune out of that and tune into what God's Holy Spirit is trying to speak into our heart and soul because His words speak life and purpose, and ready, and joy, and fulfillment. So maybe we need to just choose to get our joy back. Joshua, late in life, he knows he's not long for this world, and he assembles all their, they're in the promised land. He's the leader that got it done, and he assembles all the leaders of all the clans and all the tribes of Israel. And he calls to them that day, and he tells them once again the great story of God doing the supernatural in their nation's history. And then he calls to them to be witnesses. And he said, God had promised us things. He said, man, if you will obey me, I'll do this for you. If you disobey me, I'll do that to you. And then he says, the great verse in Joshua chapter 24, 15, he says, choose for yourselves today the one you will worship. He goes on to say, as for me and my house, we will choose the Lord. But it's a choice. We don't have to listen to all the negativity. We don't have to allow that toxicity to poison our soul every day. Maybe we need to just turn it off and tune in and let God and his spirit and his word speak life into us. Let's choose to get our joy back. After we admit we lost our joy, make the right choices. And third, purposely, and this goes right along with choosing, purposely spend time in the presence of God. Purposefully spend time with God. The psalmist, chapter 16, verse 11, writes, you reveal the path of life to me. A lot of times people just, we're on autopilot, aren't we? We're like, well, I got to do this, I got to do that, got to go to work, got to do it through groceries, got to do, you know, I mean, there's things that we have to do. I get it. But all of a sudden that autopilot goes with our relationships and all we talk to our spouse about is all the things we you know, did we take care of each other? Did we pay the bills? Did we take care of the kids? Did we? And all the and, and life becomes just a list of to dos and have to to dos, and and we leave out the fact that we get to do life together. 
And God and our Christianity can become like that. God can be somebody that's, he just, well, I spent my minutes in the Word this morning. It's a box I check, okay, and sweep God out of the way when he says, I want you to, I want to go through your day with you. And as we go through the day, Scripture tells us he will whisper into our ears, take this path, take that path. Don't go that way, go this way. He'll speak right into us if we recognize his presence and focus on that presence. The psalmist says, you reveal the path of life to me. It's not just redundant, same old, same old. He says, in your presence, in that daily practice of being in the presence of God is abundant joy. In your right hand are eternal pleasures. The thing that makes your heart go pitter-patter, Jesus loved to deliver to us. But we have to set at his side, or if you will, in his lap, and let him deliver it to us. My grandchildren are very busy boys. Even the little twins, they're scurrying about now. They're crawling, they're moving, and you gotta, you got to keep your eye on them because one minute they're there, you, you look at one, where'd, where'd she go? Where'd Abigail go? Where'd Grace go? Mal Thomas and Benjamin, the older ones that are running, oh, my goodness, they used to love to just sit in your lap, right? When they were eight, nine, ten months old, they'd sit in your lap, and they'd recognize who you are. But, man, they hit that stage where they can run, and sitting in your lap is like torture. They're like, no, don't make me sit with you, Papa. I'm like, wow, you used to love this. No, why? As they wake up and their feet, they want to go, 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 go. Sitting still is like torture, right? Well, we're not toddlers, and we know better. Sitting with Jesus isn't torture. Sitting in traffic is torture. Could I get it? Amen. But sitting with Jesus, he says, I have abundant joy. The thing that brings pleasure to your heart is right in my hand. So climb up, on the, climb up here in his lap and let's get that joy. He has plenty of it to give us. So admit we've lost it. Choose to get it back purpose, purposefully. Spend time with God. Number four, I think... Summertime's a good time to invest in relational revolution. There you go, the RR, relational revolution. If the people you have in your life are not, you know, lifting you up and pointing you to Jesus and, and they don't have your back spiritually, maybe it's time for a relational revolution in your life. And you've heard me say this. John Maxwell says this. Every good pastor, Dr. Falwell, told me this when I was a young pastor. You show me who your inner circle is, your dearest friends, and I will show you what your life looks like in the future. Because who we allow into our life is going to have an indelible imprint on how our life turns out. Psalm 1-1 and Proverbs, the first chapter, both tell us the first thing right out of the gate in the book of Wisdom and the book of Psalms, it says, be careful who you allow be your friends. In fact, Psalm 1-1 says, how happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of the sinners or join a group of mockers. He says, man, the man is blessed that decides to be wise on who he makes his friends. If they're scoffing at God and and they're just living life by autopilot and doing what the world does. The Bible tells us over and over again, don't hook your wagon to those people. Don't go through life like them, because if you hang around them, your life's going to end up in that direction. Instead, put people in your life that are pursuing God with all their heart. I mentioned my little grandchildren. Thomas has been very verbal for a while now, and we tell him, uh, that God has a great plan for his life. And, and ever since he's about a year and a half, and we've been, we started this summer telling Benjamin the th- same thing, you're going to grow up, and you're going to be a man after God's heart. And so we tell him, what kind of life? We ask him, what kind of life you got? And he says, I got a great life. What kind of man are you going to be? He goes, a man after God's own heart. And we're like, yeah, that's who you're going to be. Why do we do that? Because we're putting that purpose in his mind that he was made to pursue God. And so are you, and so was I. 
And as we pursue him, we need to put people in our life that will pursue him with us instead of hindering us in our pursuit of God. And after we invest in relational revolution, number five, I think it's good to give our lives away. If you notice in the list of five, it really covers our four core principles of this church. First of all, to know God, you have to have the relationship. And once you know God, you find freedom from your past because that's, you know, your life without God, that's not who he intended you to be. He intended you to have a life with him. And then you discover your purpose, that God gifted you for a certain task. He made you to fit a certain role in his plan. And last, once you recognize what those gifts are, you can then make a difference in other people's lives. That's how we make, that's when life gets exciting. When we give our lives away for the purpose of God in other people's lives and we impact them for eternity. Luke chapter 9, 24 records Jesus saying this, for whoever wants to save his life and live it for himself, they're going to lose it. You can't keep this life. You can only decide how to spend it. You can either spend it on yourself, which you end up losing it, or you can give it away. But whoever lives, loses his life, gives it away because of me, will save it. The first verse we read is that Jesus, talking about love and joy, that he saw the joy before him, that he died on that cross, he rose from the dead, he's seated on the right hand of the Father. And he showed that love for the whole world. Why? He wanted to make a difference in all of our lives. And that difference that he made in my life and in your life is what brought him joy to endure the cross because he looked forward to being in that throne room with all of us together for all eternity, enjoying the wonder of who God is and the world that he has created for us to enjoy forever and ever and ever. Don't miss out on that joy for some temporary circumstances in this life. If God's speaking to you right now in your heart and you know it, just say yes to him. Say, okay, God, I've been running, but today I'm going to surrender my I don't have the joy, but today I'm going to begin to have confidence in you by surrendering my life. Just bow your head right where you're at and just pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, I believe that you loved me so much you came from heaven to this earth to die on the cross and pay for my sin. Thank you for being such a wonderful God that you would think of me, that you would take my punishment. And Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender everything that I am to you because you paid the complete price for me, Jesus. From this day forward, I'm going to live for you, not for myself. Thank you for being such a wonderful God. Restore your joy to my soul today. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you for joining with us today. If you're a Christian, we want you to enjoy your summer. If you made that decision to become a Christian today, you just set yourself to really enjoy this summer like you've never experienced because that joy comes from a, a relationship with God. I just want to... Uh, Thank you once again for being so faithful during this crazy period that we're living through uh, for, for your faithfulness. It's, it's just record precedent setting. And thank you. You can give three ways to uh, make sure we continue uh, doing our ministry here and your ministry here. And you can give either online, right on our website. You can give by a phone. You can actually text your gift or you can use uh, the mail. And uh, if you're unable to come to our Sunday services, we are so glad that we have this technology where we can reach into your life and speak the truth. We really want you to enjoy the summer. And church, let's not let the circumstances dictate who we are or what we feel. Let's let our relationship with Christ, let him restore that joy in our lives today until we meet again. May you allow the joy of Jesus Christ to just give you peace in your soul.